So this is the probability density, psi squared. Psi is a wave function. It's the probability of finding an electron at a point in space. Um, so that would be equal to probability divided by a unit volume. Um, the s orbital is spherical. So that's kind of nice, s and spherical. Um, the probability density decreases as the distance from the nucleus increases. Um, and so we could make a plot that's like a multiple exposure photograph. Um, it's important to understand the electron is not moving around the flame, moving around the nucleus like a moth around the flame, just jigger, jiggering around. That's not what it's doing. Because the electron is a wave and a particle at the same time. So essentially, the electron's location is spread out over the entire volume of the orbital. It's like a standing wave. It takes up the whole volume. But you can't pin it down to be in one place unless you mess the whole thing up. So we could represent it this way. Um, and you could imagine making this plot by just pinning the electron down. You could know its position, but then you don't know anything about its movement. But just taking a picture of it every second or something for a long time, and you get this distribution here. We see that um, it's within this region, but it gets kind of fuzzy at the edges. There's, it's not a sphere that is containing the electron. It's just a region where the electron most likely is. If we graph um, probability density as a function of radius, we get a graph like this, which predicts that the highest probability is going to be at the nucleus. But we know that the electron cannot be at the nucleus, or the, elect uh, the atom would, would collapse. So there's something missing um, in this idea. So radial distribution is, is what does work. It's the total probability of finding an electron within the thin spherical shell at a diameter r from the nucleus. <clears throat> this gives us a better picture. Um, so the total radial probability at a given radius is equal to probability over unit volume times the volume of the shell at that radius. So these give opposite trends in R, because when R is very small, then the volume is very low. And the result of that is that psi squared has a maximum, which has a maximum at the nucleus, decreases with R, but the volume of the thin shell is zero at the nucleus. And so we get a different shape. So now if we look at radial probability as distance from the nucleus, we see that at the nucleus the probability is zero because the volume of the shell there is zero. So there's no probability of the electron being in the nucleus. So that solves that problem. As we move away, there is um, a steeply increasing probability of finding the electron. It's going to max out for um, hydrogen at 52.9 picometers, and then it, it drops sharply off again. So this predicts that the most probable distance for an electron from the nucleus in hydrogen is 52.9 picometers, and that is the same radius that Bohr predicted using his model. What's important is that there's a very big conceptual dif difference here. <coughs> In the Bohr model, the electron was always at 52.9 picometers because it was an object, a particle, going in a spherical orbit around the nucleus, which is much easier to think of, but not correct. In quantum mechanics, the electron is found at various radii, but 52.9 picometers is the most probable. If we look at 2s and 3s, those orbitals are also spherical. They're larger as n equals, as the n grows, the size of the orbital grows. 
And these orbitals also contain at least one node. A node is a point where a wave function goes through zero. Here we have a picture of a standing wave. You can do this with string, right? Um, and this is what happens like when a violin or a, a guitar is played, the string vibrates. You just, it's so small you can't see it. But it forms this standing wave. So here's one wavelength and there's a point here where it goes through zero. That's a node. So in the 2s and the 3s orbitals, they have nodes. The probability of finding an electron at the node is zero. And so then that's disturbing because there's a probability of finding an electron here and here, but it can't be there, so how does that work? Well, look at the string vibrating. That's zero, and this is not zero. The string is, there's this wave on this side and that side of the node, and that works out fine. Waves can do that, particles can't. So if we look at a three-dimensional illustration here, so for the 2s, orbital, it has one node, and that's this white area here. So there's um, a probability near the nucleus, and then there's an area where it's not going to be found, and then there's more probability out here. The probability density function that doesn't work so great um, has a maximum at the nucleus. The radial probability gives us this little hump here, and the node, and then this is where uh, the larger probability is. For the 3s orbital, now we've got two nodes. So an s orbital corresponds to L equals zero. Every principal energy level has s orbital, an s orbital. With L equals zero, there's only one s orbital. There aren't others with different orientations. Um, this illustrates an, the orbital surface. It's, it's easier to draw than all the little dots, but just remember it's not a container. It doesn't have a definite barrier. So the s orbitals are the lowest orbitals in any principal energy state. They're spherical, and the number of nodes corresponds to n minus 1. <coughs> So for n equals 1, there's no node. When L equals 1, those are the p orbitals. Um, so n equals 1 has no p orbitals, but n equals 2 has p orbitals, and any of the levels above have p orbitals. For L equals 1, we've got m sub L possibilities of minus 1, 0, and plus 1. And those indicate the different orientations around um, space around the nucleus. So they're sometimes referred to as Px, Py, and Pz. These p orbitals have two lobes with a node at the nucleus and a total number of nodes equal to their principal energy level. So here is the um, the probability density um, illustration. This one's easier to think about. Um, and so there are these two lobes and there's a node at the nucleus. If we look at the uh, radial probability distribution, we see a node at the nucleus and then a distance along each lobe where it increases and then decreases. So this is like a standing wave along the x-axis. Now the shape is not exactly the same, but the idea is what's important. So a p orbital is like a standing wave. This is easier to visualize than an s orbital, because how do we imagine a, an orbital that's a, a standing wave that's a circle? I, I can't do that. But this one I can think about. So a standing wave with one node would represent this p orbital. This wave is on both sides of the nucleus, but it's zero at the nucleus. 
the electron behaves as a wave, a standing wave. There are two other possibilities. We can have one aligned around the, at the y-axis or at the z-axis. Now, of course, where exactly those axes are in space doesn't matter. It's the positions relative. Three <coughs> orbitals perpendicular to each other in three-dimensional space. Any questions? Then there are the d orbitals. Um, so that's L equals 2. When we have L equals 2, then we've got five possibilities for m sub L. So now we've got five different d orbitals. Four of those are aligned in different planes, and the fifth is aligned along the d, uh, z axis. axis. Most of these are four-lobed things. The p orbitals were two-lobed, but then one of them's really weird looking. It's a two-lobed orbital with a toroid around it. Um, and these have planar nodes. Um, then the higher ones also have spherical nodes. Yeah, there they are. Won't make you draw those on an exam. Um, so this is in the y-axis, I'm sorry, this is in the x, xz plane, this is in the xy plane, um, this one's in the xz plane, and this one's like in between, and then there's this guy, right? Looks like a p orbital that doesn't know how to swim, so he's got a floaty on. Where did we come up with these shapes? We, we didn't do this artistically or because we liked how they looked. It's the mathematical equations that predict these shapes. Those equations cannot be solved exactly, but we can get pretty good approximations using very powerful computers. So this, it is what it is. Then there are f orbitals as well. So there's seven of those. Those are mostly eight-lobed. Um, and those also have planar nodes. Look at those guys. Right? What? Again, that's just the math says that's what the shapes are. So we determine those from mathematical wave functions. A wave function can have positive or negative values, and it can have nodes where it is equal to zero. So the sign of the wave function is called its phase. So a wave on a string can be above the middle line or below. It can be positive or negative. When orbitals interact, their wave functions can be in phase, or out of phase. They are waves and they're going to interfere with each other just like light waves do and like those electron waves did in the electron diffraction experiment. So we're going to look at this in the next chapter a lot more. But here are the phases. So an S orbital, um, blue is representing positive and red is representing negative. So the, here, this s orbital is in the positive phase. The 2p orbital has one lobe in the positive phase and one lobe with the negative phase. So with all these weird shapes, why are atoms spherical? Well, if you take all of these different shapes and superimpose them, like they've attempted to do in this illustration, all of these things inside here will give us a roughly spherical shape. But the electron's behavior inside of that shape is very complicated. It's not a little solar system with electrons going around in rings. Right? So it's a lot messier than that.